Well, welcome everybody to July 13th, uh, regular legislative meeting. So at this time I'll be looking for a motion for the adoption of the agenda. Councilor Waters, thank you very much. Is there any additions or uh, any deletions to the agenda? Uh, Councilor Barry. Yes, uh, thank you. I'd prefer to deal with item um, 9.1, the draft of the library bylaw before dealing with the letter of understanding. It seems to be a more appropriate um, order uh, for discussion. Okay. So if we were to say that we would like to put it at 6.3A, would that work for you? Okay, so that'll just move right now. So 6.3A. Yeah. Oh, Cliff? Yes, sir. Um, may I uh, suggest moving uh, the uh, library board letter of understanding down to section 9, make oh. it 9.1, and then we'll do the, the bo library board by law as 9.2. Sorry. Oh, sorry, 9.1, and we'll make the letter of understanding 9.2. Yeah. Okay, is everybody good with that? Okay. okay, so that'll... Okay, so we have one amendment to the agenda. All those in favor? Carry. Thank you. Okay, next up is adoption of the minutes of our last regular uh, legislative meeting. We're looking for a motion for that. Councilor Warwa, thank you very much. Is there any errors or omissions within those minutes? Seeing no red mics. All those in favor? Carry. Okay, our first delegation is uh, Jameson Brown, the communications and marketing, marketing manager, and uh, the branding proposal presentation. So take it away, Jameson. Uh, thank you very much, Your Worship, and good afternoon, Council. Uh, what we have in front of you in, in terms of your packages, and it will be showing up on the screens as well, is essentially our uh, rebranding guide. Um, this has been a process uh, that we have undertaken over the last uh, several weeks, and essentially it stems from uh, the current logo that the uh, town of Vegreville employs uh, is uh, tough to remanufacture, especially when it comes to uh, digital printing and uh, everything alike. Um, while our beautiful Pesica is uh, absolutely stunning, it is very complex, and uh, that makes it relatively difficult to again put on to uh, large signage and uh, to uh, even more complicated to minimize for things like shirts and uh, business cards and alike. So uh, we were tasked to uh, come up with an alternative and uh, we've worked with uh, several different uh, companies and firms but the latest um, has uh, kind of led us down the path that we're about to go down as it pertains to this. So I can uh, either turn your attention to your agendas or to the screens and we'll kind of go through what this rebranding guide entails. Um, essentially what we're looking at on slide one is uh, what the new logo will be. Um, uh, I'm not sure if uh, you're, you're seeing the resemblance in terms of the font to a couple of uh, relatively iconic signs in this community, but uh, that's where the inspiration behind the font came from. And uh, you'll notice the symbolism uh, one of the prevalent elements of the Pesica are, of course, the uh, repeating trinities that encircle the top and the bottom, representing the eternal life. And uh, this gives you an idea of what the logo would look like in uh, different circumstances. You've got your uh, primary, your one color, and your reverse. Uh, the next page is uh, essentially our color palettes and uh, those codes uh, therein would ensure that we could color match everything moving forward. Uh, this is really going to help us as well uh, when it comes to our branding. Um, because there are so many different intricate colors within our current logo, it, it's tough to exactly color match them. And especially as you shrink that logo down, what you're seeing is sort of a bleeding and a 
the blending of the colors. So we've got some very distinct colors that again will only help our uh, branding moving forward. Uh, as we uh, unveil a new logo, it seemed only fitting to take a look at our topography and our, our, our branding in general. Uh, so our, our headline typeface would be uh, DIN condensed, subheader, DIN alternate, bold, and our, our body copy, Geneva. And uh, we'll show you a few examples as to why it's important that we have a relatively distinct and um, uh, I guess a formatted font for all of our documents moving forward. And uh, finally, this is uh, our, our social media. Um, uh, there's no denying social media has uh, you know, uh, taken on a uh, gigantic uh, part in what local government does. And it's a, a gigantic way uh, to communicate with the voting public, with the residents and the visitors to this community. So this gives you an idea of what our social media profiles would look like. Um, we've got uh, the minimized uh, V for the town of Vegreville, taking it again right from the actual logo, and then of course those trinities, uh, as well as uh, the trinities in the background on the social media cover photo. And uh, these would be distinct across all of our channels, um, and you've got a couple of different uh, variations of the submark, uh, the white, the gold, and the black. So now that we have this uh, brand, um, what comes next? And uh, obviously, you know, pending your approval on uh, the upcoming council meeting on July 19th, uh, we then have to start working at implementation. So the implementation timeline, for lack of a better term, uh, would first start with uh, the things that we could do for free or next to free. Uh, internal documentation changes, um, uh, you know, we would try to aim to ensure that those are in place by the end of this month. Uh, changes to vegreville.com, where of course our logo is very visible. Uh, staff email signature changes, social media changes, all of those, again, uh, in effect by the end of the month. And uh, again, we can do those for free or next to free, but um, there's a lot of logo presence when we send out documentation that uh, uh, it's important that we get that looked after right away. One of the uh, concerns that we, we had and the council had was we didn't want anybody to feel like we were getting rid of the iconic egg without paying homage to it. Um, and so, I think in the video I'm about to show you, we, we do our best to, um, through social media, explain where the inspiration through the logo came and th from the egg came to the new logo. Um, and so uh, hopefully this does just that in terms of uh, being able to inspire uh, the residents to understand that we're not getting rid of the egg, we're just trying to simplify it for branding purposes. So my suggestion would be that we would roll the, uh, load the logo changes out when our social media uh, platforms are changed over with that video on our uh, social media cover shots, where then it's almost immediate. You're going to be able to see it. You're going to be able to understand the inspiration. And by no way, shape, or form are we trying to, again, uh, get rid of the Pessica. We, we just want to find a way to simplify it, but are still you know, very much paying homage to it in our current branding. Uh, this goes back to uh, some of the branding that we were talking about in terms of why it's important that we've got dedicated fonts. Uh, this would be an example of what a press release could look like with the new logo. Um, here's a, an example of a bylaw uh, and uh, some of the, uh, the write-ups and how it would look like in terms of the branding. And uh, email signatures. Having a plan in place as we move forward makes it easier. And uh, these are all, again, things that we can do for free or next to free to help you know, slowly but surely change our brand. Phase two of the implementation, uh, implementation timeline, uh, not free, but certainly things that would have to be changed anyway with the change of a logo that we could start working on this fall. Uh, banners at entry signs, uh, banners downtown Vegreville. Uh, the administration office wayfinding signage, uh, that uh, would be something that we could get to work on almost immediately. Uh, council chambers signage and fleet vehicles. I'm going to show you examples of all of those. So here we've got banners that, uh, again, are a, 
above the, the, the iconic sign for which we are uh, drawing our inspiration um, uh, for the new logo. Room to shop, room to play, room to grow, room to stay. Uh, while showcasing the new logo and showcasing some of our, you know, amenities and uh, some of the great things that we've got in this community, I feel like this would pay uh, or play two roles. One, it uh, certainly opens it up uh, in terms of uh, the showcasing the new logo, but two, showcases our community. Uh, a lot of people come to the Pesica, they come to the beautiful Elks Kinsman Park. We want to make sure that when they're there, they realize that Vagreville's got a lot more to offer. Than, than this park, and uh, these banners could potentially give us an opportunity to do just that. Uh, these are some spec banners of what we could put up uh, downtown Vegreville. These are actual photos of Vegreville uh, from historic eras, days gone by. And again, these are things that uh, if we were to rebrand downtown Vegreville, historic downtown, and we could throw those banners up as well while also showcasing the new logo. Uh, town of Vegreville, uh, behind council. Uh, this is obviously a, a, a bit of a, a Photoshop job, but it gives you an idea of where we can start um, putting, putting the logo and uh, showcasing the new branding moving forward, especially with this beautiful new council chambers and the new technology that we're presently using, a great way to showcase both. And then the fleet vehicle. I'm not sure if we've got approval to move up to the tremor when it comes to the fleet vehicles, but uh, that's up for discussion. <laughs> Nonetheless, it gives you a pretty good idea of what we could be looking at. And uh, finally, uh, implementation timeline phase three, uh, fall, winter 2021, moving into uh, 2022, things like business cards, town of Vegreville apparel, remaining old logo banners and signs, and uh, town of Vegreville merchandise, making sure we're ready to go for uh, a fresh tourism season that could potentially be even further wide open in the spring of 2022. Um, these are things that, again, we start looking at down the road, but certainly, nonetheless, things that would need to be changed over if we we uh, change our logo and our branding. And uh, with that, if you have any questions, um, absolutely feel free to uh, throw them my way. Okay, well, I'll start. And uh, I want to thank you, Jameson, for the work you put in on this. I know that there was a different pitch from almost everybody in council here, but somehow we all agreed. And, and the fact that it's something that's very iconic, the older font and the original signs of Regerville and and still paying homage, like you said, homage to the egg is, is very nice. So does anybody have any comments? Go ahead. Um, thank you, Jameson. It's great to see uh, all the different versions of um, the branding, and I'm really happy to see we've really gone far uh, since I've been on council in terms of what we imagine ourselves to be. So I, I really appreciate the marriage between old and new. And I, I think that's um, very obvious in the way that we've included the symbolism of the Pisinka and made sure that it's still a modern approach, which is, I think, what this council has been really trying to embrace. Um, I did have a few quick questions. Um, I don't know if you want them all in succession, but I'll, I have three. So the submark, I'm just curious where would that type of um, icon be used? That would be, um, I'm just trying to imagine what it looks like for somebody who's not familiar with Vegreville. Um, if you've got the banner across Twitter, for example, then you'd see the egg and maybe that would twig people's knowledge or memory. So I'm just curious where the submark is used. Sure. Uh, the submark uh, would be used in exclusively social media format. So uh, social media has essentially all of the channels, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, TikTok, if you want to go down that road. Uh, they've limited what you can have in your profile picture to a circle. So what happens when you try to minimize the font to it fitting into a circle? It almost becomes unreadable because... Uh, most people are looking nowadays on their phones. So the, the circle becomes very, very small. Uh, that'd be the only place that we would uh, actually ever use a submark uh, with the minimized V, just in social media uh, and just specifically in the actual profile picture. But the hope would be that uh, moving out of the video, we would then always have our, of course, uh, Pesica uh, in our... Uh, in our uh, cover photos that allow for a little bit more space, a little bit more creativity. Okay, and 
if you, if I could, Your Worship. Um, my other two questions, uh, just quickly, the video looks great. I, I think that is a great capture of seeing where the origin of the, the graphic comes from. I'm wondering, is there a voiceover that comes with it eventually? Your timbre explaining the transition would be helpful, I think. I think we've had a lot of good response to the videos that are shared on our channel, so that's the last. And the last question is timing. Um, is it possible that any of this would be potentially ready for the upcoming fair? We've got one of the few local fairs that's being offered this year. It's a longer duration, and I don't know if that's too much pressure, if there's any part of the rebrand that would be ready for that August 4th start, just because, again, we're going to have, I'm hoping, uh, a great attendance and a lot of people that maybe aren't familiar with Vegreville or are, and we want to reacquaint them with who we are currently. Well, um, uh, I'll start with the first question out of the gate, and that was uh, the the voiceover. That could certainly be arranged. Um, there was music in in the background. You 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 didn't hear it because uh, well, I I don't know how to make the sound work on my computer. Uh, to put it bluntly, I can make the video. I just can't make the sound work. Uh, with that being said, if we were to incorporate that video into the cover photo, the idea would be that uh, the, the video pre-rolls and you just see the imagery of uh, moving from those tridents and then into the eventual logo. But if we were to actually do some sort of a, uh, a big push in terms of a campaign on social media, there's nothing that says we couldn't have music or some sort of a voiceover explaining it. Uh, that video would be specifically the one that you saw, just for the cover photo, for the simplicity of it. I don't want people to feel like they need to click on it to get more. I hope that the imagery is enough. Um, but we could certainly uh, look at, uh, you know, some sort of a voiceover or music or something to liven it up a little bit uh, for, for outside of cover photo purposes. Uh, getting back to the, the, the question in regards to the fair, uh, I don't see it being out of the realm of possibility. Um, we haven't uh, explored much beyond some specs because we wanted to make sure we had council's approval on this. So uh, obviously on Monday, we'll be putting this forward for a decision. Uh, we wanted to make sure that you guys were aware that it was coming your way on Monday. And once we get to Monday and hopefully uh, a decision to, to forge ahead with it, I don't see why we couldn't come up with some sort of plan to ensure we can kind of unveil the uh, the logo in some way, shape, or form to the public in time for the uh, Vegreville Country Fair. Okay, so that being said, uh, your timelines on how we are moving forward have budget uh, implications to them too. So I don't want to, you know, I want to make sure that next Tuesday we're not parking all the pickups outside and stripping them down and putting new logos on them. I mean, we we will do this as needed, right? We'll, we'll keep this cost efficient as we can. Well, one of the things that comes to mind, and again, uh, we have yet to discuss this I internally, uh, there is the parade. And uh, on a relatively razor thin budget, we're gonna have a float uh, in the parade. M maybe we, it's just a matter of putting the new logo on a poster board or something along those lines. So it's a way for us to unveil it uh, and not needing to worry about upgrading uh, you know, to a Ford Tremor and having the fleet of vehicles ready to go. Well, I agree with that. We can just uh, reproduce that new logo in cardboard or some reasonable hand-drawn fact suddenly to get this off the ground. And as we need the order cards and, and letterhead and stuff like that, then we'll transition into it. Understood. Okay, uh, Councilor Warwick. Um, okay, so I do definitely like it. I actually really like the social media and the submark. Uh, I just had a couple questions on that, or maybe a comment and a couple questions. I would like to see us as soon as possible, once it is approved, the definitely the council chamber example, because I think that will actually be one of our best tie-ins, especially if everything is broadcast and it's you know, constantly in that one spot. Um, so my two questions were, with the silver color, do you think that there's gonna be a little bit of problem seeing it? It just looks a little light on a couple of them. And the other one is uh, for our other sites that are independent, like the Explore Vegreville, were you seeing it switch over for all of them or were you still thinking to maintain those ones separate? And if you wanna think about it, that's fine. I kinda just throw in that quickly. Yeah, that, uh, you're throwing me to the wolves. No. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, when it comes to the, the coloring of the silver, it really is going to be a matter of what it's up against, right? So uh, if it's up against a black or a dark, it's going to be easy to spot. But we do have, uh, I think it was page 
one or two, all of the different types of logos where depending on what we're using it up against, we're gonna have different variations, all staying true to the logo. You've got your reverse and your one color is what they're called, either a white or a black. So we wanna make sure that all colors pop. We're gonna make uh, darn good and sure of that. And uh, again, uh, based on everything that I've seen on computer screens, the silver does pop, uh, maybe potentially what you're seeing in the print, it, it, it can sometimes fade a little bit, but we're gonna make sure that uh, all colors are visible, and if it's in a situation where it's up against a really white or a light background, we'll, we'll just revert to the, to the one color black. Um, we will be talking about social media policies and, and procedures you know, in, in the coming weeks. Out of the gates, I don't know if I necessarily see Explore Vagreville, for instance, changing their logo or what they're doing, right? Because they, they don't, they're not even using the town of Vagreville's logo right now. Um, that channel is absolutely fantastic when it comes to being able to communicate um, some of the lighter things about Vagreville in terms of uh, drawing tourists to town and so on and so forth. So moving forward, I would like to see some sort of uh, iteration of the logo into their social media branding. But we haven't got there quite yet. And uh, that would be something that I would really want to make sure that I loop, uh, of course, our Tourism, Recreation, and Culture Coordinator, Anya, into it. We want to make sure we're working collaboratively. So just so everybody knows, like uh, the two uh, older, the iconic, the, the font, Vegreville signs in each end of town have been painted already. And this is why, and this is part of the rebranding that we're going with. And I would imagine that there will be a little addition to each sign. The, the trinities will show up on the signs here eventually. We're getting some pieces, extra pieces made. Is that correct? Okay. Excellent. So, and I would imagine all of our emails and stuff will be taken over pretty soon. And the, 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 that'll be on there. That'll be good. Yeah, the email signatures, as soon as we have your approval on Monday, those are one of the things that we can almost immediately change over and um, for the uh, very low, low cost of free. Yeah, well, right up my alley. Okay, is there any other comments? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Council. I hope the community gets excited. Uh, you know, I know what there was a lot of work put into this, and uh, the part uh, where we're using the old iconic part of the, the sign is, is awesome. So, there, next up, we're going to go over to uh, Director Rowe, I guess. The rest will be waiting until 3 30. So, you go ahead and start it up. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> the first item is uh, paddle boats at the uh, Pisinka Park. Uh, it was brought uh, up at the last meeting uh, by yourself. Uh, so just some clarification questions uh, to Council uh, about uh, paddle boards. So uh, to allow personal use of paddle boards uh, at the park, do we want to just stick with paddle boards? Would we like to look at kayaks? Are we okay with inflatables? Uh, the original policy that, uh, or draft policy that I had uh, had brought up, uh, use of non-motorized recreation at the Vergeville Elks Pond. Uh, so I had uh, uh, times that uh, it uh, can be in use for personal, and we had uh, kayaks, paddle boards, uh, small inflatable boats under 10 feet, and. We would have all the appropriate signage in place. People must comply with uh, provincial and federal uh, Transport Canada regulations. And yeah, so uh, how does council feel about, because um, they're, I guess the original one that was brought up, the original uh, idea behind it was that uh, we were gonna wait and see how the paddle boats uh, did out there and what there was for space that it wasn't gonna be too congested. So. Well, I think, yeah, one of our main concerns was the wharf itself and how everybody would be bringing their own apparatus and how they would be in, getting into the water. So is your vision or, like, you're thinking that everybody will use that wharf as they're launching? Uh, I'm not sure that I'd like everybody to be using their own personal uh, boards on, uh, on that deck with... Uh, our paddle with our pedal boats. Um, there is a number of locations actually around the pond that uh, anybody who is uh, is good at uh, kayaking or paddle paddle boarding uh, paddle boarding can could easily get uh, get on the water. So. Okay. Well, I know we're Councillor Barry. Yes. Thank you, Your Worship. 
Uh, my thoughts on uh, introducing another item like paddle boards would be for us to wait and see how things are going and then consider as to whether the town would have a few paddle boards there that could be used similar to the paddle boats. I'm not particularly in favor of opening it up to um, public use, uh, bringing their own, because I do not know just what that would look like at this point in time. I would sooner uh, do this one step at a time. I think paddle boards would be of interest, but I think that would be something that we should consider to budget for two or three of them, the same as the paddle boats. That would be my point on it. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, seeing none. Myself, personally, I, I really don't think that we would be launching uh, anybody else's stuff off of our little uh, wharf that we have built there. So. <coughs> Is there anybody opposed to the, the idea of Councillor Barry is opposed to people bringing their own. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts, uh, Councillor Warwick? Well, I am a little bit torn because I do know that a lot of people have their own and it's then the right equipment for them. Um, my concern would be then um, liabilities and waivers and controlling, um, you know, the use of, say, your own life jackets or are we providing them where if it was something we looked at moving forward with, um, then at least they had to sign that out and they would be signing out the safety equipment as well. Um, I think our paddle boats did have been doing amazingly. We are all aware of some of the very sad uh, circumstances that have come with people who are not respectful of the very nice things that we've had in the town. And um, I think because of that, I would right now feel that we have to hold just a little bit to see what we can do to alleviate some of those problems that we're having and some of the entrance problems that we're having. So for me right now, I'd like to see us just hold. Okay, Councillor Waters. Is it on? I think it's on. Um, yeah, um, I'd be wanting to wait as well. I'd be concerned about some of the supervision if we have enough people staffed, because right now with the signing out of the paddle boats, um, they know how many are out there how many to be accountable for and that kind of thing. So I think we should wait this season out and see how it goes. And then come spring, maybe talk about it again. Okay, Councilor Rudy. Um, I think it might be a great addition. Um, just looking at St. Albert, for example, with the, the cross, uh, the bisecting of the community with the river, it's well utilized and well enjoyed, but there are some differences and I think it would be wise to wait. This is new for us to be allowing people onto the water um, in this format. It has been received very well. I guess there is uh, another consideration too, is that the, the liability is one thing, but I guess there's also the responsibility of supervising. So if we say 10 feet as the maximum, what's to stop somebody from bringing in their, their large canoe? We've specified inflatable kayaks. I mean, as we know, people like to push it, and I don't want to be facetious, but who's ultimately going to be supervising that? It's quite different to sign out a paddle boat um, and have them come back as compared to actually going out and supervising whether or not um, somebody's brought in their, I don't know, I can't even imagine what else they would bring in, but they will be as creative as they can possibly be and outside of the parameters that we would set. So I think for right now, we've got enough to deal with and it would be something to look forward to in the future. It's already drawing great attention and we just want to make sure people are responsible with what we are going to be including in the future too. Okay, well, looks like uh, we're going to take a wait and see approach on that. Um, just for those people that are watching uh, regarding what uh, Councilor Orwell was referring to, we've had some vandalism and some night riders down there and uh, on our paddle boats and uh, it's a shame when we try to offer something nice in the community and uh, this is the way it turns out, but uh, We'll keep foraging ahead and try our best to, to try to keep uh, people out of there uh, after hours in the middle of the night the best we can. So I guess now for Phil, we'll just take a wait and see approach. And uh, maybe we'll look at it again in the spring, the new council, and uh, come maybe some pricing. I know those paddle boards are not cheap, but I don't, I don't even know what a paddle boat costs, to tell you the truth. I've never priced one out. But... Uh, We'll wait and see, and hopefully we'll have a, a you know, the rest of the summer uh, will be a good fit with our paddle boats so the people can enjoy it during the daytime, and uh, we'll go from there.
Okay, next up is uh, Ag Society request. All right, thank you. Uh, we have uh, got a request from the Variable Ag Society. Uh, they would like council permission to use the Trans Canada, build, <coughs> Trans -Canada building uh, parking compound uh, to the north of the building as a secure parking venue and then use busing as a transit point uh, to the grounds area for the uh, Deerland Country Fair. So uh, I said I would bring it forth to council. So what they'd like to do is they would have staff uh, volunteers parking people in the compound and then they would have Bedella's busing that would be shuttling people from there to the to the grounds and back so secure parking in the in the Trans Canada compound so so when you say secure they would because, man it's, all, the because gate. It's, it's all fence they would have yep. staff there at 20 at all at all points through the through so the parking any type of a theft that happened there'd be no liability on the none car. none to us no Okay, uh, what do you guys, anybody got any thoughts on that? Councilor Wilma? Um, I don't have any issues with it at all. I would just want to clarify with them what would happen should some people decide not to come back on the bus and the vehicles be left at the compound because obviously they're not going to want to stay overnight. We wouldn't want our guys having to come and go. So that would be my only concern. But other than that, I have no issue. That is a very good, good concern. <laughs> because if somebody stays a little later in the beer garden in the bus service, you know, we might have a bit of a problem there. But all in all, myself personally, I don't see a problem with it. Um, I mean, that'll get rid of some of the congestion around there with vehicles for sure. Okay, well, seeing nobody that's dead against it, Councilor Riddick. Oh, uh, I, did, sorry. I didn't see the lights. So We're still right. getting used to it. Too close. Um, I don't have a concern against it. Are they anticipating um, a huge attendance and trying to alleviate the congestion down at the grounds? That's my understanding, yes. Okay. Well, I think that might be a good problem to have that we have to consider um, off-site parking. I do believe they have a much bigger midway uh, plan this year, so that'll be uh, less parking uh, in and around the, uh, the, grand, uh, the grounds, uh, plus uh, additional RV parking. So. I think they're just trying to eliminate uh, all the like the all the congestion around that area. So, I think some residents might be happy that um, the parking is elsewhere. The one question I would have is um, just, I guess, operationally, if there's anything that is currently being used in that facility, that of course our operations come first. But it would be a good problem to have that we have that many attendants. So, facility-wise, it's it's all locked up and secure. So it would just be the the grounds itself. Okay, so it looks like the council says you can move forward to just bring up those concerns, how they plan on dealing with uh, somebody that would like to get their vehicle out after the hours of operation. Okay, thank you. And next up is the emergency management bylaw. All right, thank you, Worship. This is a <coughs> draft uh, bylaw uh, number XX2021, Town of Ergoville. It is a quite a large document. Do you want me to go through this word for word, or the the what's that? <laughs> this bylaw number XX twenty twenty one of the Town of Vergeville in the Province of Alberta to establish a regional emergency advisory committee and regional emergency management agency. Whereas the Council of the Town of Vergeville is responsible for the direction and control of its emergency response and is required under the Emergency Management Act, RSA 2000, Chapter E6.8, the Act, to appoint an emergency advisory committee and to establish an emergency management agency. And whereas the Municipal Government Act, RSA 2000, Chapter M26, provides that a council may establish a, by bylaw special committees of council and delegate powers and, and duties. And whereas it is desirable in the public interest and the interests of public safety that such a committee be appointed and such an agency be established and maintained to carry out council statutory powers and obligations under the said Emergency Management Act. And where it, <clears throat> whereas it is recognized that an emergency or disaster of a jurisdictional, multi-jurisdictional nature could affect any or all the municipalities within the geographical boundaries of the town of Vegreville and the count Minburn County to such a degree that local resources would be inadequate to cope with the situation independently. And whereas council wishes to enter into a regional 
emergency management partnership agreement with other municipalities within the geographical boundaries of Minburn County for the purpose of integrated emergency management planning and operations. This partnership to be recognized as the Minburn Regional Emergency Management Partnership. And whereas a local authority may delegate some or all of the local authority's powers and duties under the Emergency Management Act, now, therefore, the Council of the Town of Vegreville duly assembled an Acts of Emergency Management Bylaw as follows. Okay. So there. You can just give us basically what an outline of what the responsibility is, Cliff. Sure. Um, Thank you, Your Worship. Um, don't and I have worked on. There you go. Uh, Phil and I have worked on this uh, regional emergency management bylaw and what it does is it incorporates that the town can have its municipal emergency management as well as being involved with a partnership for regional emergency management. So it covers off both sides. And for uh, simplicity and geographical uh, purposes, uh, the regional management, or regional emergency management is being referred to as Minburn because it's within the county of Minburn. Okay, so uh, we've incorporated the concerns that council had about being just part of a, of a region. We can still uh, this bylaw um, retains our municipal autonomy as well as um, authority to uh, be part of a regional partnership. Um, with the county for emergency management. Uh, the other um, uh, participants would be County of Minburn, uh, Village of Innisfree, and Village of Manville. And I know we have our own independent one for our municipality. What would our role be in the uh, County of Minburn emergency plan as a council? Uh, anything outside of the town of Vagerville would be uh, dependent on other the other one of the other three municipalities so whether there was um, a requirement for emergency management services either in the county or the two villages um, depending where the emergency um, exists either the county or the village or one of the villages would initiate uh, the emergency management um, uh, action and any requirement would depend on what the emergency is and what services we could offer. But at no time would we uh, be in um, default of anything within Vagerville. Okay, so, see no red lights? We've all read it here, and this is coming into Monday's meeting? Yes. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, right, right now is a good time, or wait till Monday, but uh, this is a whole separate from our, our own that we use for ourselves, so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Rowe. Next up. I have one more. What's that one? The Federal and Provincial Tourism Grants. Oh, yeah. Uh, so this is an informed council. Uh, we've, <coughs> we've uh, two grants have been released, uh, one from the Government of Canada and one from the Government of Alberta. Uh, the two grants are pertaining to tourism development um, in wake of uh, COVID response and uh, providing those uh, tourism opportunities in a, in a safe and healthy manner. Uh, the first uh, grant from the Government of Canada is the CCRF, the Canada Community Revi Revitalization Fund. It is a fund up to $500,000 uh, pertaining to tourism. And so after some discussion, uh, what we've decided to do is to uh, put in for the wayfinding uh, signage, downtown banners and lights, uh, of course, after council approval with the logo, completion of the no frills walking trail from uh, that was scheduled to be done, but uh, just couldn't do it effectively this year. So that, uh, that, that fund, will, will, those ones will cover that fund. Uh, the one from Tourism Alberta, there's two streams, tourism infrastructure and tourism assets. The tourism infrastructure uh, is up to $500,000. It's a matching one in one grant. And tourism assets up to $100,000, 100% uh, approved costs uh, based on 
what we can uh, look at through the grant. Uh, we'll be submitting that uh, uh, for the under tourism assets for the walking trail to the event center, which if, uh, if it's successful, it will cover the cost of the entire walking trail from Pissinga Park to the event center. So if there's Anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Council Warwick. I'm just wondering uh, with these, what the timeline was for, um, not necessarily for receiving, but for completion of projects. So I'm just wondering if there was any eligibility, I'm thinking on the infrastructure side, to possibly look at some of what we had discussed at the event center with campgrounds and whatnot. I'm just wondering if that might be a I jump stop. I have uh, double checked with both entity entities and campgrounds are not eligible for either of these grants. Okay, and of course, I talked to you earlier about this and I was hoping that we could use it for community buildings or community centers, and I was hoping that we could get an upgrade in the kitchen at the social center, but uh, that doesn't qualify. No, the, both of these grants are basically for anything that will increase uh, tourism arts and culture in your in your community. So uh, it, a lot of them are focused on, both of them are focused a lot on downtown revitalization. Uh, so that's why we kind of went with the downtown banners and the lights and uh, I, if successful, I'd work with Jameson and uh, we say we would look at putting banners uh, like all throughout the year, seasonal banners uh, up and down the entire 16A corridor plus downtown and maybe refresh with some some nice lighting uh, to add some vibrancy to the to the community on the drive through. Hey, Councilor Wood. Um, are these stacking grants? Would be one question, and the other one you referenced lights, and I'm not sure what you mean by lights. We haven't heard that before. Well, <clears throat> uh, stacking grants. You mean using for both? Yeah. Or? So I'm. So for example, the the gas tax has been doubled and that was something I was going to ask later on but um, if you had another grant pocket of funding are you able to for example that you said this is matching grant um, for the Alberta one I believe if that's a matching grant and we haven't budgeted for it at this time is it a possibility that it is a stacking grant so that you can use funds that are derived from other sources to be able to apply for this one uh, to answer your question, uh, Councillor Rudick, these are not stacking grants. Okay. Okay. And what reference were, were the lights you were talking oh, about? Oh, so uh, we are talking about uh, putting rope lights, LED rope lights on all the light standards through, uh, through the community and they're multicolored, remote control. They can be put up once and changed uh, for seasonal colors. So multi-colors, Easter colors, Christmas colors, Halloween colors. Um, so I've done, done some research on what other municipalities have uh, that, that can use these. So that's, that was a thought process behind it and have offset uh, banners and lights uh, right through the entire corridor that, uh, that would turn on at, uh, at dusk and use very limited power, but would add a lot of vibrancy to the community coming, coming through town. And I, just so everybody knows, the biggest reason that we weren't really uh, able to apply some of this stuff, to, especially uh, to the uh, CCRF when it comes to uh, downtown revitalization, it was probably keying on that. You just need a lot of partners uh, to come forward. And uh, we right now, like the history of uh, downtown revitalization is really, you know, I think it was 20 years ago that it was a good... A plan, but every time that it's been brought forward uh, with the, the downtown business people, there's not a lot of feedback to come back right now. So, um, those lights you're talking about, would they be a permanent install? Like they wouldn't be able just to grab a hold and peel them off? They're not mag magnetic or anything like that. No, they they wrap around the light standard at the very top, and they're on a bracket, and okay. yeah, they're hooked up, and they're permanent lights. Okay, so the CCRF is not a matching grant, but the the, government, the Alberta one is a matching grant. 
It depends what stream. There's two streams. So one is infrastructure and one is assets. So if we go the asset route, which a walking trail to the event center would uh, would be, uh, then that that is 100 percent approved costs. Okay, and uh, these had to be in today, correct? No, next Thursday. Next, next Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there any more questions regarding uh, the application and the usage or the how we're going to try to put this money? To work for us. You go right ahead, Council. Sorry, Phil. Just one more question. Um, just because I know how convoluted sometimes the provincial uh, grant setup can be. So, just in reference to what His Worship uh, mentioned in the kitchen, did they specifically um, exclude that you couldn't um, enhance? those types of facilities. And the reason I ask this is, I know before they also said, for example, an arena, they had said that, um, you know, a municipality couldn't apply for, or say, the CFIP grants. But as an association like hockey, if we had wanted to expand, say, the condensers that are within it, we could have applied specifically because we were enhancing one specific program. So sometimes it's about wordage. But I just wondered, did they specifically exclude kitchens from it? Or just because I know how convoluted their grants can be sometimes. So. The, the social center is, under the definitions, is not classified as a community center. Uh, if it was something, say, the Sunshine Club and youth could use it, seniors could use it, like the whole community could use it, mm -hmm. and, it was benef and it was a direct benefit to tourism in the community, it's, that's, that's possible. But like I say, after I had a good conversation and the... I was told flat out that this w wouldn't be accepted because the the social center itself is not the tourism draw. So. Okay. Well, uh, hopefully uh, we'll get that all in on Thursday, and we'll hear back quickly as we can. Thank you very much. <coughs> Next up, Mr. Dale Lefebvre, Director Lefebvre. equipment, some of the operations at the landfill. I know council's always interested in our, our large asset out there and uh, just to let you know how things are going. Um, unfortunately, there's no noise or sound on the videos, so Jameson's going to pretend to make the sound of a compactor nice. while you watch the compactor. <laughs> Settle in. Finally, that education is working. I guess he's not. He's not in. He's not going to do it. He's not doing it. So this is one full load out of the truck um, coming down the working face. Uh, the crawler loader, the equipment we used before, would take four or five pieces out of that one load to finally get it pushed down. This hits it in one load. So the report is that we're more than pleased with the, with the performance of this piece of equipment. It, uh, if you remember the landfill compaction presentation that we'd made to council a while ago, it exceeds what, what we were estimating for performance. That working face that you just saw, that TANIC compactor come down, is over two weeks he's been on that spot. Two weeks of solid hauling between our contractors and, and it's a busy time of the year at our landfill is now. And the working face has moved ahead less than half a meter. And it's doing it in, in, in a third of the time, for sure, uh, than the old equipment. Um, and also, it's the compaction that, that we're getting. It's not so much about making things thinner and thinner and thinner. It's about getting the air out that's in between all of the things. And that's what it's been able to do. So we're extremely happy with it. The crawler loader is getting used probably 20% of what it was being used for before. And the hard rubber tired loader stays down at the bottom of the face for pushing up the wood pile and metal piles. And it's also just not being used. So when we anticipated our, our crawler five-year life cycle to expand to 10. That's guaranteed it'll be 10, most likely much more than that. So so really happy with it so far. So I know we had the conversation the other day, about, the other day Dale, about this piece of equipment, but uh, it's far exceeding what we thought it was going to do, is capability of compaction. Right, right. You can take the old crawler and go over it 20 times so it's not moving anything down anymore and then drive this over top and it just starts pounding it down again. So it's a far more efficient way to do it the way we are doing it. Yeah, we're really pleased. So the life expectancy of that asset, the, the landfill, 
where we had placed that with this piece of equipment, we know we're there plus some probably. So yeah, it's a very reasonable target. Yep. Okay, and you had another video today, very special day. Yeah, we have a video of our landfill shredder. Just hold it. Don't don't press play yet. And uh, the problem we have at our landfill is the mattresses, and we get a lot of them in for our region. Uh, they are almost impossible to bury naturally as you compact them they just bounce back up bounce and they'll work themselves right up out of the working face so this year we've rented the shredding unit um, and we're running some mattresses through it we're running some couches love seats chairs things like that to show council the, the size of the product obviously when it's a mattress to what it comes out to as when we shred it okay roll jameson mattresses uh, action video This is the first time we've had this company in do. This is the first time we've had a shredder out at our landfill, yes. So it is, again, uh, very effective for these large bulky items, and it's taking it right down to manageable pieces for sure. So how many times a year, or what's your expectation for you uh, to have somebody like this come in? This is a, a big savings to our landfill. It's also an expense that we didn't have before. They're, they are uh, a few dollars to, to bring in. Uh, we did not get the amount done that we wanted to with the amount of money that we had budgeted. And <clears throat> with what's remaining out there that still needs to be shredded, we have to change the way we're doing things. So we're going to take the furniture the couches and chairs and take them now and run the tan over top of them to see how much it'll pound them down and if we can eliminate furniture out of this pile and just focus on mattresses then that's what we'll have to do to try and keep our costs down there is an option to mattresses it's just not a desirable one where we have to hand load them all into a highway trailer and then we drive them to calgary in our highway truck or someone's highway truck cars and then they will actually recycle them there at a cost of x amount of dollars per load so I don't know who's excited about loading mattresses in a in a trailer by hand, but we could be done. The fact is, we'd probably stick with this with this method. It was, you know, over between fifteen hundred and two thousand a load to drop off in Calgary for mattresses. You don't get a lot of weight of mattresses in highway trucks, so this is a better option. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Of well, it's good to see that uh, that very expensive piece of equipment is met our expectations and then some. And and now with uh, ATCO's announcement, uh, with the recycling uh, and the composting uh, center just north of us uh, going to be expanded and stuff, we'll see what we may be able to else take out of our landfill and then take it out there. So, excellent. Anybody have any questions? Go ahead. Sorry, Dale, if I can go back um, just to ask, so the mattresses and furniture that was shredded to this point, would you see that happening annually or this is kind of a big project, try to get as much done as you can and then keep on top of it moving forward? That's right. So now that we know how much we can do with the amount of money we budgeted, then we'll go for next year to try something different. Instead of renting it um, as a contracted service, we can now rent just the shredder and bring it out for, say, four week period by rent it for one month and see what those costs are going to be and then we'll we'll load it ourselves because the amount of time that it was here and what it cost it was we didn't get a lot done as, as much as we wanted to get done so so if we can remove furniture <clears throat> to make <clears throat> that waste stream a little bit smaller and then just focus on mattresses which are the real problem and I think we'll be able to keep up with annual shredding or every two years or something like that <clears throat> so you said earlier maybe on uh, coaches and stuff like that we just throw the uh, the pillows or the cushions into this pile and then we would just run our uh, new uh, compactor over top of the, the thing itself and crush it down. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Uh,
you have a development permit application. I have a development permit application, and the reason this application is in front of council is that because this uh, residence is located in direct control, it's 5121 51st Avenue. Uh, direct control means that nothing can happen to the property, even the development permit, unless council gives the development authority, myself, uh, authority to move forward with the application. So that's what it's here for, for, uh, for you to see at this meeting, and then the next regular council meeting, we'll put it through for council to vote and approve the RCD so this gentleman can go ahead and renovate um, a house that has some history in our community. It's uh, constructed in 1913, so it's 108 years old, and he's not just putting some paint on it. It's some structural reinforcement. It's going to be a nice fix, a nice, a nice renovation, a good repair to make the building last many more years. And can you tell us why <coughs> that area of town is under direct control? A previous council had um, elected to make that area direct control to give them specific control over the area as it was a mix of commercial, residential, high density with an apartment and single family residential. So at the time when it was rezoned to that, the thought was that if those houses were to come down that it would probably not go back as under residential that lot. Is that what the thoughts were then? I'm not sure, Your Worship, if that's what the thoughts were. I know that if you district something as commercial and as residential usage, when the resident becomes damaged by more than 75% or isn't uh, lived in for a certain amount of time, that it would then convert automatically to commercial, and that's a way to control districts. Uh, direct control just simply gives council to say on each renovation or construction or project case by case by case instead of presetting it for administration to follow a policy or, or a guide. Well, does everybody understand what the request here is? The only difference is that the way that a previous council had rezoned that. At the one time they thought that the commercial part of town may push out that way or the highway may come back to it. So, so this will be on Monday's agenda? It will, Your Worship. Is there any reason that you'll... Sorry, Councilor Waters. That's all right. Uh, just a question. So the properties around this one are all residential at this time, are being used as residential at this time? On that side, yes. On this block, yes. Okay. For the half block, until you get to the old AGT or the TELUS building, from there to the west is residential use okay. in a direct control district. Okay. If this property was under strict residential and this uh, application came in, would your department have any problems okaying these uh, renovations? We'd have no problem okaying these renovations. Okay, does anybody else have any more questions of Dale right now? Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Mr. Paul Casey. Uh, yes, Your Worship. Uh, this is a summary of our reserves or where we're at in accordance with our reserve policy uh, to present to Council uh, on a periodic basis uh, where we're at with our reserves. So this is as of June 30th. Uh, we started the year with seven, about 7.3 million, just over 7.3 million dollars in reserves. Um, the budgeted transfers out of 416,000, those are all were included in our 2021 budget, so those were made. They were just carry forwards to be used this year. There's still a little bit left that has to be used, um, but the expenditures haven't incurred for those yet. Um, the budgeted transfers in were also what was budgeted in our budget to go in there. The unbudgeted transfers of $1.3 million were all approved by resolution, which is the second page of this document. It lists all the resolutions and what they were for. Um, obviously, the biggest one for the equipment reserve was for the landfill compactor. Um, the one for the infrastructure reserve was for some additional costs for, some cap for this year's capital works projects. They were unanticipated. Um, and the facilities life cycles unbudgeted reserves were for the renovations for the uh, economic development office and for the rest of the administration office upstairs. The reallocations were reallocations from various other reserves and from our un, uh, un but not unallocated reserve, which is our surplus, our unallocated surplus. We took money and put it into reserve. 
And we ended the, we're, uh, sorry, to the end of June, we're still at uh, just about $6.7 million worth of reserves left to utilize. Okay, thank you. Is there any questions regarding how those reserves and how they were used or where we're at now? Oh, oh there's a red light. Um, I just have two quick questions, uh, one for clarification and, and one for explanation. On the second page, um, it's written beside some of the entries that it's committed. Yeah, Does that, that mean means that, that money has not yet been spent. Okay, thank so you. So are we, I mean, the, sorry, the money is in the process of being spent, but we haven't finalized what the amount is. So it actually hasn't come out of the reserve, but it's on this schedule showing that it's committed to come out of this reserve to a maximum of that amount. Okay, perfect. Thank you for explaining that. And then my other question was the unbudgeted transfers in for the cemetery perpetual care. What would that entail? There's a 15% charge for every plot that we um, sell or niche that we sell, and it goes into this reserve, that 15% charge. And how long has that been a policy that? Uh, this is the second year that that's been in place. Actually, it's only been in place for a year because I think it went into place in about June last year. So. Thank you, and I'm happy that this is um, something that we're seeing um, perpetually. I, I appreciate that not only have we um, tightened up some of the policy around reserves, but also being able to see that um, periodically is, is reassuring to all of us here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. There was no other questions. Okay, uh, next up, uh, town manager Cliff Craig, you've got two with the library to start. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the first being uh, the board uh, bylaw or bylaw unnumbered yet. And what this is is to establish the uh, Municipal Library Board. And this updates our 1989 bylaw. So some of the uh, regulations that were in place in 1989 um, have changed and we needed to uh, redraft and um, set out the terms of reference and the responsibilities for the uh, library municipal library board. So uh, this is the bylaw that um, um, we have drafted. Um, as you're aware, um, each committee or board requires a board bylaw. So, um, and this one, um, we are updating it so that it complies also with current legislation. Hey, any questions, uh, Councillor Berry? Well, I'll, uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll, I'll start, first of all, with a question. I'm not certain why this bylaw is being brought to us, um, and has it gone through a judicial review, a legal review? Um, I have not um, had a legal review on this, uh, but we have, um, compared with other municipalities that have a municipal library board bylaws, and... Um, we uh, drafted this to suit uh, Town of Acreville's um, purposes. With my, um, my questions and problems that I see with this bylaw is it circumvents what the Libraries Act actually is. The bylaw to establish a board only occurs once. We already have a board and we're not replacing that board. And it is established by one bylaw at the very early point in time under the Libraries Act, Section 3, where the Council of the Day says they want a library, so they put in a bylaw and register that with the minister, and then that becomes a corporation. And henceforth after that, we actually have no control or any reason or right to interfere with what's going on in that corporation, other than what's set out in the Act and that is very minimal. We have the right to appoint the board members in accordance with the Libraries Act. We have the right to approve monies in whole or in part, the budget that they prepare and bring to us, but we don't develop that budget. And we have the, the obligation of doing some of the accounting. I really do not believe if this was looked at legally that um, sections 7F and sections 145 of the 
MGA trump the Libraries Act. This is not a committee nor a board of the town. It was established under the Libraries Act as a corporation and we have no right to deal with or try to put in other conditions. So what I'm saying is this is why I wanted to discuss this first of all, because some of, some of the matters that are being talked about here would be more appropriately dealt with in policy or in the letters of understanding between the board, which is a corporation, and the town, which is a municipality. If you wish to have um, a county representative on there, that is not done by bylaw now. That we have, it has the controls in the Libraries Act, which states that you have up to two councillors that can be appointed to it. By agreement with the library, we can have one of those as a town councillor, one of those as a county councillor, but we can't dictate to them as to who is on that board in that fashion. So there's, there's other aspects of this that I believe are more appropriately matters of policy. There's only need for one bylaw under the Libraries Act to create a library, and that was done so many years ago. And if you take a look also under the Libraries Act, under Section 5, updated as of 2019 even, it states the boards of management of all public libraries to which Part 3 of the Libraries Act applies are continued as municipal library boards under this Act, which means that they keep it updated all the way. Everything that was occurred in 1980 or in that era is still factual today. And they're a corporation, they're not a board or a committee of this council. So I would like to have that reviewed to see if my interpretation is more correct than what is being worded here. Because I don't think we have the right as a council to start dictating to what that corporation is doing or not doing, but we can negotiate with them in the letters of understanding as to what some of the makeups are and what we are responsible for and what they're responsible for. They are created under the Libraries Act to provide the service of library services to this community. They're not doing it for the town per se. They're doing it as a library. So I think that's, uh, that concludes what I would like to say on that. I don't think this, this uh, bylaw is required. Even though it's a 1989 bylaw, there's bylaws that don't expire unless, we dissolve, unless the library board dissolves. Until then, it's established, even in the act when they update it, they say they all continue. So that's, um, that's my position on it, thank you. Okay, have we had uh, a bylaw in place before and this is just an update is what it is? Or? We have a, a bylaw, our latest bylaw was 1989 and it would be repealed through this bylaw. I can certainly send this for legal I'm reason. I'm saying I don't think we have the legal right to repeal that previous bylaw nor do we have the right to put in this bylaw that changes the conditions that are not within the Libraries Act. There are conditions going into this bylaw that do not exist in the Libraries Act, nor does the Libraries Act give us the permission to have those things in there. You cannot change the term to four years for a councillor sitting on a board when the Act, the Library Act, is three years maximum. There are things like that that are discrepancies and we don't have the legal right, in my opinion, to be dealing with this. That Library Act, or the bylaw that was passed in 89, is still functional, still valid, and still in place, and should remain in place. That, we're not creating a, a board. We're not creating a library board today. It says, you, you have the wording here saying that this council wishes to have a library board, so we're gonna create a library board. We already have a library board. It's been here for years. Okay, so we can't, we can't just all of a sudden jump in on top of something that's been legally created under the Libraries Act, and it's registered with the minister. Okay, uh, Councillor Riddick, you have a uh, comment? 
Um, I had a question, if I could direct it through you, sure. from Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Berry. Are you suggesting, too, that the 1989 bylaw may have also been inappropriately enacted, uh, given your argument that you're proposing today? No, I'm not. I'm saying that the Council of the Day had the right to... I'll give you the wording. The Library Act, Section 3, enables the establishment of the Municipal, municipal Library Board in a bylaw by council sent to the minister. So the whole point is, is that the, the council of the day said we would like to have a library board. So under the Libraries Act, the Libraries Act came into place in 1980. Prior to that, libraries just existed and were funded this way, that way, but we're just an entity. The problems put in the Libraries Act and then followed it with the Library Systems Act in order that municipalities could create a library board. So the whole point is, is that once the council passes a bylaw establishing a library board, that library board is registered with the minister and becomes a corporation. It's worded right in there, a corporation. So they are an entity of to themselves. And that bylaw is what created them. But once it's created, they become a corporation. And then we become a hands-off person or group that only take a look at approving their appointments, because there has to be a legal mechanism to appoint somebody to the board. That's spelled out in the Libraries Act as to how that is done. And the other aspect is, is when they ask for requisition for money, we, the Library Act gives us the right to approve those monies in whole or in part, but we do not dictate what their budget is. So we don't prepare their budget. So they come forth with a request for funding and we look at it and we have no right to say, well, you shouldn't spend the money there or shouldn't spend the money there. All we can say is we'll give you it all or we'll give you part of it. So those are the only controls that we actually have as a council. And then the town, under the Libraries Act, has a commitment under the Libraries Act that they actually help do the accounting. And then that is spelled out in other areas. So the aspect is, is the letter of understanding is where you start putting in policy as to whether there's a town, whether the two councillors that can be on there can be one and one, or it can be two. And then the rest of the members are just members at large. So I, I, I would really seriously, I'll totally apologize if you get a legal opinion on this and I'm wrong. But the way I see it, the bylaw that established this board is the only bylaw that is required. From there, we do things by policy and understanding. Okay, so You'll uh, check on this I, before I move Mondays. forward this for legal review, and then I would ask that item 9.2 be tabled until uh, pending the legal review of the bylaw, in case there's aspects of the yeah. uh, letter of understanding that need to be incorporated. On the letter of understanding, most of the rewrite of it is excellent and very appropriate. The only thing that would be uh, concerned is they're asking the town to take on a couple more expenses, such as janitorial um, and, and some of those sort of things. But the only thing there is, do we want to negotiate with them to put in one or two of the clauses that you have in the bylaw into the letter of understanding? Correct. So that's why I would so, ask yeah. that it be tabled until we pending sure. legal review of the bylaw. I, and I'm only arguing this point because I do not believe that the AGM has the right to impose over on another act. I do not believe you can take a clause that allows you to make things appropriate in a committee or a board of the town and impose that on a corporation that was established through the Libraries Act. I do not believe that there's, I think there's a, a legal problem there. I'll confess I'm not a lawyer. I have an understanding of the law, but I'm not a lawyer. But I, I'll apologize if my interpretation is wrong. Okay, well, we'll 
your intent was just to freshen up this bylaw, really. Correct. Right? Okay, so get some legal uh, opinion on it, and then we'll bring that and the letter of understanding back at a later date. Okay, thank you. And you have uh, one more uh, draft advisory boards and committee policy. Right. So uh, from legislative committee meeting in June, um, I was asked to uh, develop a policy for advisory boards and committees. So this is the uh, draft of the uh, policy that I, or policy that I have drafted up. Um, so what it does is um, outlines what the uh, roles and responsibilities of the advisory boards and committees are, uh, that they are advisory boards uh, to council, um, what staff representation uh, would be included on these uh, committees as administration support, not as voting members, of course. Um, it sets out the board and committee terms uh, the budgets and expenditures, and uh, from the discussion from the, the June, one of the June legislative committee meetings was um, advisory boards and committees to uh, separate and have committee and board budgets as opposed to being included within a department budget. So um, as an example, the three uh, main advisory boards and committees that we have would be economic development, tourism, and FCSS, so that there would actually be a budget for uh, the economic development board, economic development advisory board, the tourism advisory board, and FCSS advisory board, so that the board would have a budget as well, separate from the department. right now. Go ahead, Councillor Warwick. Just one of them. So yes, so I understand the committee um, board budget. I guess my question there is like in looking at some of the roles and responsibilities, it will say, um, for example, under the 2.3, uh, that the advisory board shall not give direction to administration nor shall request without approval of council of preparation of reports, research, work assignments. So I think the part that still becomes a little bit unclear then, are we saying that if they have a committee board budget, then they can go ahead within that budget? Um, and it's because there's always this extreme gray area that comes. I know that if ever we hire companies or anything, those are contracts with the town and then they have to come back through the town for a request. They also have to be signed through the town. But there's a lot of things within our boards that we go ahead and the board moves forward based upon the budget that we have. So I always feel that that's an area that everyone's a little bit confused about otherwise sort of by this wording every single thing that we voted on should be coming back there shouldn't be a picking up of you know coffee provided at an event without it coming back to the town council so it still seems a little bit unclear uh, I understand that the original budget should always come back from council and many major projects come um, you know for a recommendation but I still think we need to give them some clarity on that or I'm thinking even um, Councillor Lemko like our our meeting that we would have had the other day and a person's looking at uh, bringing in um, an artist well we'll bring those things forward but the little individual cost well then technically somewhat by what it's saying here we shouldn't be voting on and allowing our board to do any of those things to set up the artist or get the hotel or anything so that's where I'm always struggling with understanding and a, a bit more clarity on it okay so we're gonna go to, uh, to Cliff here just to get an answer for you first and then we'll come back just this policy is put in place to uh, take away all the questions about that really so uh, the intent was that if the boards have a policy, have a budget, then within that budget, uh, they can make their decision, like for your coffee or your artist, within there. Where th this was um, also intended was for your projects, the larger projects, to come forward to the town for approval prior to expending those funds. But for like coffee at your meetings or whatever like that, that's part of the board budget. And that would be presented at budget time um, through either through the department, yeah, usually <coughs> through the department. Like this is new for us. Mm -hmm. 
uh, to have a separate budget, but it, it was clear after the discussion that we had that it wasn't a board budget that we had prior, it was a department budget. And within that department budget, we, there were funds allocated for the board. So this way, we will separate them. So there'll be a department budget, and I'll use economic development as an example. There'll be a department budget for economic development, and there'll be a, an economic development advisory board budget as well. But um, as an example, in that specific uh, board, there's um, funds that are allocated for opportunities and initiatives. Those project-based items would come to council prior to expending the funds. But if they want to have coffee at a meeting or if they, if they um, have a, a conference to attend, that would be part of the operating budget. So Does that help you out? More than anything, it's, it's laid out to help the so the decisions don't have to come back for advisory boards. We give at budget, we give money to, uh, let's say, the economic development that's what we're using. And then out of that budget, a certain portion is allocated to the advisory board. They don't have to come back to us to how they're going to spend it every time because we've already put that in the budget. Now, as the, the economic development board, I mean, the department itself, as they're going through things and they're using budget money, and if it's something uh, you know that they need to ask us how they should spend the money, or they, they there's so much money allocated to the department itself, but we'll need the clarity on how they're going to be spent. Advisory boards shouldn't have to come here all the time with their small budgets and ask, you know, can we uh, can we afford to have pizza twice this, uh, you know, the next two meetings and stuff, or it's just going to define their budgets what they have within that advisory board. Yeah, and I guess maybe I shouldn't have used the small example because then we went too small. I'm actually talking a little bit bigger on that. So I'm going to use tourism because that's an easier mm -hmm. one. I know at budget time, um, uh, Director Rowe would have brought forward and said that they're proposing to, say, do murals and whatnot, and there was a certain budget we approved. But then once we got past that main approval, we're then saying, are we then saying that that project, as long as it stays within the budget that was approved at that time, they could go ahead and then make the decision about how the individual, because that's what I'm looking at. So say a mural, we might have approved the budget that included murals, but then are we saying that as they were selecting the mural, each one had to come back to the town, and so did all the costs associated with the artist and all the rest of that, because that is a big, that is a project, right? And I think we do need a clarity, because I would say that that doesn't consistently happen across the boards in the same way. So that's where my concern would come in. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as an example for tourism, uh, say the uh, purchase of the, the paddle boats, as an example, okay? That would have been a budget item brought forward, and it would have either been in either department or board. And uh, just for discussion's sake, let's say it was a board, okay, project. That was, um, it was funded, it was approved in the board budget. Then the board can go ahead with, those budget funds because it was already approved. Okay. Okay. Same if it's a mural project and it's X dollars that were approved within the budget, then that's that's it. But those have been brought forward to council through the budget right. process. Okay. Yeah. So. Go ahead, okay, Councilor Ruby. So um, I guess I I am kind of of the same mind as as Councilor Warwa. I have some specific questions about. Um, the policy and I appreciate that you brought it forward because it was um, specifically my concern that there is um, a gap between our fiduciary responsibility and the governance process. If boards are being asked, so for example, I was asked to make a presentation as a councillor on a board to ask for approval here. I don't think that's a good governance process if the budget has already been approved by a department and I think the clarity that your worship has described is not what I see here. It actually leads to the gray area that Councillor Warwa is asking about. So um, so I, I'll ask some specific questions and I, I know that this is a new policy for us, a new bylaw, so there are things that maybe policy. we need to try and see if we feel comfortable with it. Um, and maybe it needs to change a little bit over time. But um, specific questions that I had, for example, is um, on 4.2. Um, so we're talking about the first meeting of the year. So is it the first meeting of the year according to the calendar year? Is it the first meeting of the year? Because a lot of these boards and committees have their own bylaws. They've established themselves according to their own calendar. 
it may or may not coincide with council. I guess right now it's kind of a moot point because we've got economic development, tourism, and sorry, what's the other one that we have? FCSS. FCSS, right. So those three would be more in adherence with uh, a council guideline, but mm -hmm. in that specific example then, it may not jive with our schedule. So just trying to imagine what that looks like. So we're spelling that out here, but then each of these boards also have their own bylaw or procedure that sets them up and, and has their own set of guidelines. So do those marry together? Which, which trumps which? So that would be my uh, first question. First of all, the, the bylaw would trump the policy. And uh, we have been consistent in trying to set the dates for all of our new, it was a new uh, requirement in the MJ to have a, um, a bylaw for each board and committee. And uh, so we made it consistent. So um, so they should be, I would say, like I said here, the first meeting of the year, um, assuming it's January. Okay. Okay. And so, yeah, and that's my understanding, of course, the yeah. bylaw trumps policy, but then if you have three bylaws, which one is the one that supersedes? I just, Trying to wrap my head around that part there, of it. There should only be one bylaw relating to the board or committee. Right, but if we've got three different boards, that's where I'm, I'm okay. just curious. And then the other one uh, specific question would be 5.2. Um, looking at um, the expenditures, and this kind of goes into the area that Councillor Warwell was talking about too, is that, um, for example, I would think and maybe this is always the case, that we're laying out things that should be um, self-evident, like the expenditures, of course, must relate to matters directly within its mandate, so that makes sense to me. But I'm, I guess I'm curious about 5.2.2, talking about the annual report. So who would prepare such a report? So is it the department preparing a report to the board? Is it the board preparing a report to council? I just, again, I'm, I'm trying to untangle the fiduciary responsibility and good governance practices as well as trying to meet something that is clear and understandable for staff as well as council. This would be a board preparing a report for council. So then as a supplementary question to that, so let's imagine economic development. So I'm preparing a report that is separate from the manager, from the department, Correct. to council. Correct. This would be on the board. Um, the expenditures report. of that board itself. Right. So what the board has done as opposed to what the department has done. So because it, it, like I said, the intention, which is new, is to set up board and committee budgets separate from the department budgets. So the department budgets are reviewed by the directors and myself. Uh, the board budgets would be reviewed by council. Okay. And I, again... I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to see what this would look like in practice because FCSS, for example, who is the chair of FCSS right now? So we've had other outside parties on each of these boards. I guess tourism is the one exception. Would we, you would ask that a chair of one of these advisory boards prepare a committee report, an annual report that would be presented to council as an outside body or it would be party. up to the board who they decide to prepare the report. Normally, it's a chair or vice chair, um, but there's also council representation on the board or committee that could present to council. Okay, I, I, okay. I do still have some concerns. I appreciate that we're moving further down the path for clarity, which is what I, um, I was hoping for. So I appreciate that. So. Okay. Well, I, I think what we need, really need to understand is, is that advisory boards do not drive the budgets of departments. So within yeah. a department's <clears throat> budget, there will be money set aside for an advisory board. And then they will bring to council how the money was spent. But they don't have to come to every decision on the what's allocated for the advisory board because the department itself is going to drive its own decisions. Th those will be through the director within their budget. But the advisory boards don't drive how each department is going to spend the money. And I, I, I guess that's my issue, is that I don't think that that's ever been the case. And there have been times where there may have been some confusion about who's ultimately responsible. But I guess I, I don't see that as the issue. I see the opposite as the, as the concern is that are we making a process that's not actually answering a concern that we have? 
So I, I guess I'm just asking that rhetorical question to us gathered here is that what you're, what you're explaining, Your Worship, isn't something that I've seen traditionally as a concern, particularly when we're talking about managers and departments and directors that are ultimately responsible for that budget. And as a council, we have already made that fiduciary responsibility in um, allocating that budget. And then we see that repeatedly through reserve and audit review and periodic evaluations of those expenditures. So I guess I just want to make sure that we are um, not creating a process that isn't going to serve what our goal is, which is ultimately good judicious expenditure, evaluation, and decision making in a way that's straightforward and easy. Because I, I guess the other concern is, is that when we ask members of the public to be part of our boards, are we asking them to do things like this, you know, prepare an annual report? I, I, I don't know. I mean, we've had some very keen economic development um, chairs in the past that have been very um, excited to prepare an annual report, but that is not something that any of us have ever been uh, asked to do in the past. So just rhetorically asking that, is this serving the purpose that we're looking for, or are there some other things that we need to consider? Well, if there's money allocated within a budget of a department to an advisory board, there should be some reporting on how that money was spent by that advisory board. But my, I guess my point is, is that no advisory board, there is nobody, as a chair, you're not sitting there, I'm not sitting there with a the check writing any money. There is, that isn't happening. So your request that this is being evaluated or over, overseen is happening already. So it, it already is in place. So I'm not sure that there is no fiduciary responsibility that's not being met. There's no threshold that's not being observed. And I actually think that in, in this instance, I... My concern was originally, I think it's inappropriate for me as a chair of a, of a board to be putting an expenditure forward to council because it's already been allocated to that department. I don't think it's appropriate as a governance process, not because it's me and not because it's that department and I feel specifically um, strong about expenditures in that department, but more as a governance process, I think it's incorrect and I don't think it actually makes us more um, transparent. I think it does the opposite. It adds another level of Red tape, if I want to use that term. So what you're saying is there was a request of an advisory board to go ahead and, and uh, use some money within a budget, but it should have been brought to the council through the Economic Development Office itself, the request not through you, not as the chair. Absolutely. I think that's there is a process in place, and we're subverting that process by having chairs um, potentially bringing forward expenditures. Now, if we're going to have, like Cliff has suggested, that, um, that this would be a new process where the board has a budget allocation which is separate from a department, mm -hmm. that again is something different, which I don't necessarily disagree with. Maybe that's a better process. Maybe that's an easier process. And I don't want to diminish the autonomy of a board to be nimble and respond to things, but... <coughs> I don't remember ever having an FCSS advisory board come to us with a specific budget ask, except at budget time to a department. And I, I don't know that we are not meeting all of the requirements in terms of being judicious and, and uh, meeting our fiduciary responsibilities. So I'm just not certain that this is quite meeting the mark. Go ahead. Um, I know what we were trying to do originally, because, oh, sorry, yeah. I didn't see you on the side. Um, I, I know exactly what we were trying to do originally. We were saying that there's very important initiatives that are often tied to our long-term funding and long-term planning and that we can't have advisory boards driving it separate without it coming through council. And I think that is primary and must happen, especially when we're talking about everything from tourism to economic development. Um, I guess my only concern is just looking back at this, I see two sides of it. Um, I agree that if we've approved a budget, then they don't come back to us with the little things we're not expecting that. So I do think there should be just some general res monies going towards them in their own budget that allows them to do their operational. I do think that we should have to approve the big projects like we're doing it um, already, uh, and that's good. But then once we approve the project, I believe they should be able to run within their project they put forward. My concern with just the way this is set up is um, whether it be myself or anything, none of us have any 
role in the actual expenditure of money. So I would have no ability as a chair to come in. That would need to come through at least, um, in my case, I'll use the tourism, but at least Anya with tourism or from Anya up to Phil as the, the director. I, I couldn't imagine myself coming in as um, just the chair and going through that list because I don't actually know how the checks went or how it went. I know what we approved and then somebody else makes it operational. So just a little concern with that. Okay, hey, Councillor Barrett. Thank you, Your Worship. I, we had this discussion to some extent at another point in time. And my biggest concern that we have here is I believe that we're getting the roles of advisory committee and governance committee or board a little bit inter intertwined here. As an advisory board, they give advice to the department that they're part of, tourism, Economic Development, FCSS. When you're looking at them as an advisory, I can see them having some petty cash, if you want to put it that way, a budget that allows them to do and operate so they have an operational budget. All projects should remain within the department, and they are only an advisor to the department as to what that project should entail or what it should, uh, the expenditure should be. But all of those uh, uh, expenditures have to go under the department because they're the only ones that have the legal right to spend the money that was budgeted, not the advisory committee. When you're looking at coffee, when you're looking at small things, when you're looking at just how do they operate, I can see them not having to have come back to the department even to order a pot of coffee. But when it comes to a project like a mural, I think it is the department that has to finally approve it on the advice of the committee that was established to give them advice. So they're not a governance body. And I think that's the problem we're getting. If we get giving them a budget, then we're slowly moving them into a governance body where now they're almost like the department themselves. I think this is where we've got to really kind of watch just how far we get down this road of who's got the money and who's got the ability and authority to spend it, and then to report it. Okay. Okay. I will um, um, do a revision on this, and I'll bring it back to a future legislative committee meeting. Yeah, so the, the intent of this policy is never to give an advisory board the, uh, the uh, decision making over with a budget, a full budget. It basically was to the fact that they could have some autonomy of their own where they can make smaller decisions with how they, they, they handle their business uh, when they're operating uh, their board. And, you know, if a recommendation, like what we've seen coming from economic development last time, it certainly never should have came through a uh, councillor. It should have came right through the department itself. So we'll take a look at it, and we'll redo it, and we'll see where we're at. Okay, now we have a committee, a delegation, sir. Mr. James McCrimmon is here. Now, do we need to go to closed session for this? Yes. You do. Okay, so there's no one else in the room, so <coughs> we will take a motion to go in closed session. Councillor Barry, at 3.38, do we need to shut the door? We need to lock the door. We haven't had a closed session with a delegation before, so we should.